Matthew chapter 19. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, chapter 18, he departed from Galilee, that's up north, and came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. Now, coast in the Bible, you know, we think of a sea coast. Coast in the Bible is a boundary line. A coast can be where two pieces of land and no water. It's just a boundary line. But he's, uh, beyond the Jordan, the river, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. They're following Jesus for a reason, for a purpose, and they're not giving him the time of day to be alone. Everything that Jesus done is in the open with vast amount of witnesses. So all these people that claim that Jesus never lived, Jesus was this a teacher, Jesus this, Jesus that. When they stand at the great white throne judgment, these multitudes are going to be called up and say, no, listen, we saw him. We, we witnessed what that happened. Whatever the event is, we witnessed that. How dare you say he's just a teacher? Imagine that guy, uh, uh, pull out your withered hand. Boom. You're going to have that guy just stand back and not say nothing when you say Jesus is a pony. You're going to have uh, Peter, James, and John just sit there when you say that Jesus wasn't God when they were on that mountain of transfiguration and Moses and Elijah just saying, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. Everything's done, sir. Stand before all the angels. Even the devils proclaim who Jesus Christ is. Mm -hmm. Jesus has all kinds of witnesses. 19 chapters. What witnesses do we have when he was born? Here comes the shepherds. What witness do we have when he's a little child in the house? Here comes the mad guy. More than three. It's a caravan. Multitude. Get multitudes. 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 When he comes into Jerusalem, his final time in Jerusalem, there are multitudes proclaiming him as king. Great multitudes follow him, and he healed them there. <clears throat> he's on his way to the cross. Let me ask you something. If you were to know that you were going to die a violent death, and so well, can, can you hear? Can you heal my my, <coughs> my blindness? Can you hear my my witheredness? Can you take care of my ears? Can you take care of my lunatic? What, what would your attitude be? Don't forget, everybody's rejected him. His disciples don't have a clue. I'm going to Calvary. I'm going to die in the cross. Lord, who's the greatest? On the third day, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rise again from the dead. Hey, we heard his angels say he's not here. Yeah, sure, right. Oh, we seen Jesus. He was right here. Unless I see the prints of his nails. You wanna go on with the story? What's, what's Isaiah 53? A man of sorrows. Everybody's against Jesus, and he's still going to the cross, and he still stopped. And he's healing people. We're on the road to Calvary now in Matthew. Now, I say that because watch what happens. The Pharisees, uh-oh, also came unto him, tempting him. They don't want an answer. They want to catch him. And saying unto him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Now, what's that have to do with anything? He's been healing people. They're going to the law. And we're going to find something we can catch Jesus with the law. <clears throat> and he answered and said unto them, Have you not read? Ooh, how's that? They're supposed to know the law. They're supposed to read the law. That he which made them at the beginning made them male and female. America 2016 doesn't understand that verse. America, England, and all the nations practically today will say a man and a man and a woman and a woman. And deny what God said. I made a man and I made a woman. So Jesus is backing the story of Genesis and Genesis 2. He's authorizing, authenticating Genesis 2. 
and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother. Who said that? Adam said that. Jesus now authorized and told us what Adam said. Jesus is quoting Adam, and Jesus is God. That's the law. Genesis is the first book of the law. He's quoting from the law. See, they're quoting from Leviticus. Jesus is going way back to the beginning. Hey, let's go back to the first man and woman. What was the purpose that God made? He made a man and he made a woman. Leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife. And they twain shall be one flesh. You marry a woman, you're one. When you marry a man, you're one. When you marry a same man and you may marry a same woman, you're an abomination. <clears throat> and your church that teaches that, you're an abomination too. Wherefore, they are no more twain but one flesh. That's why the woman takes her husband's name. What therefore God has joined together, Adam and Eve. Now the subject is Adam and Eve. Are you going to go so far as to tell me that, that God's going to join two lost people together? Or God's going to join a lost person and a saved person? Or a lost person and a Jew or a Gentile? You think God's going to go that far to join them together? But God joined Adam and Eve together. Let not man put asunder. Don't separate them. Well, Paul tells us in Corinthians, listen, you know, there's certain things. You can separate because you're not getting along. Adultery. And Jesus said adultery. Hey, that's, that's divorce. See, Jesus is going back to the beginning when the first marriage. And they said unto him, you know what he did? The law of the law. Leviticus or Deuteronomy. He went to Genesis and described what marriage was. Because they're talking about putting away a wife. They're talking about divorce. He said, well, you know what? You know what marriage was for? It was for a man and woman to join together and never be separated. That was before the fall, wasn't it? They said unto him, Why did Moses... Now see, now we're going to the law. They want the law. They want the law to take Jesus and condemn him. Well, Jesus is the author of the law. Well, Moses commanded to give a writing of divorcement and put her away. So what they're assuming is a command and it's approved. Moses did say, for any cause, Moses said that, you can put her away. He said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, sin, heart condition, suffer, that means allow, you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, Adam and Eve, it was not so. God never intended once a man and woman got together to ever separate. Now let me ask you a question. Before Genesis 3, when did Adam and Eve die or would have died? They never would have died. Had Genesis 3 never happened, Adam and Eve would have been married today. They would be celebrating their 6,016th wedding anniversary. Never mind the birthday counts. You have to call 12 fire departments to put it out. But that was before sin came into the picture. Whosoever, uh, from the beginning was not so. And I say unto you, Jesus, whosoever shall put away his wife, Put her away, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery, and whosoever marrieth her which is put away does commit an adultery. 
Bible's written to save people. No unsaved person is going to say it. Jesus says, listen, fornication separate. If your partner has stepped out from you, God says that marriage is finished. You have taken flesh to join his flesh and join to another flesh. Remember that woman, he said, go tell thy husband, well, I ain't married. I know. You got four or five husbands and the one you're with is not your husband. And when you go back to the law and study the law, here's a guy who, who let his wife go. She finds another man, she marries him. And she's a bad woman. Just He says, you know what, get, it, get out. And the law said, she does not go back to her first husband. The second husband is more binding, the second marriage is more binding than the first, according to the law. And now Jesus is not condoning, uh, he's not... A, saying that divorce is permitted like America you just go out and, and just get it done because you know movie stars and all that it's something that you venture into wisely and we go further his disciples said unto him if the case of man be so with his wife it is not good to marry his disciples said wait a minute if this is the case if we're never to separate then you know what the best thing is not to marry But he said, Jesus said to them, All men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. For there are some eunuchs, a man who cannot have children. And we're going to look at the classes here. Which were, which were so born from their mother's womb, naturally, birth defect has made them unable to produce children. Nothing wrong with it. And there are some eunuchs which have made eunuchs of men. You see that in Esther. These guys will be put in charge of women. Well, they'll give an operation first. Make them more trusting with the women. Men would do that for servitude. Class number two. And there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. Wait a minute. Kingdom of heaven. Not to Jerusalem. He's talking to Jewish people. He's talking to Jewish Pharisees. He's talking about the Jewish law. And he says, you know what? When he talks about the classes of eunuchs, it can be of the womb. It can be made by man. Or you know what? You can say, and it doesn't say anything with an operate. I'm just going to make myself pure and remain a virgin for God. There's nothing wrong with that. No one has told him to be in our society or our church that you're to do it. You've just decided in your life, I'm not going to get married. And remember what Paul said in Corinthians about if you if you can't uh, what is it? if you can't contain yourself, marry. Here's a guy saying, you know what? I just have no desire for that. I want to serve God and do right. Here you go. He that is able to receive it. Let him receive. All right, you know, if you can do it. So even Jesus, like Paul, says, you know what? If you can do it, be single. But marriage is God ordained, according to this chapter two. I don't mean chapter two. I mean chapter also. Then were there brought unto him little children. That he should put his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked him. The disciples don't want anybody around him. The 5,000, Lord, you get them out of here. You know, we mean we're going to feed them. Lord, get these multitudes out of here, will you? Get these children away. Then were, then were there brought unto him little children. He should put his hands on them and pray, and the disciples rebuked them. Can I change this a little bit to bring this up to date? I have your permission. Then were they brought unto Santa, little children, that he should put his hands on them and pray. Is that what you do to children with Santa? You bring them to Santa Claus, but you don't bring them to Jesus.
So here are parents, they're bringing their children, said there were there, brought unto him little children. Somebody, brought, they didn't walk up themselves. It's got to be parents, grandparents. Somebody has cared to bring these children to Jesus. And the disciples said, get them out of here. Isn't that remarkable? Can you could you think of something like that? I know my family's gonna look. Could you think of something? Here's a child that would want to trust Jesus Christ or hear the message of the gospel as a parent would drag them by the arm and pull them away. Hey, go listen to this music more. Here, here's a Marlboro. Don't listen to them. They're doing when a parent acts like that, they're doing the same thing as the disciples are doing. Get that child away. That's the time to bring him to Jesus. But Jesus said, suffer, that means allow. Suffer little children and forbid them not. Put that to a parent that does that. To come unto me. For of such is the kingdom of heaven. What's the kingdom of heaven? It's like a bunch of little children. Remember he told his disciples earlier, when, who's going to be the greatest? He grabs a little child, he says, except you be as this little child, be converted as this little child. Innocency. Loyalty. You know, you could take a child and put him up on a table and say, jump, and you're going you're gonna to reach out and grab, and you grab him, and he does it again, he's giggling, and you could do, accidentally drop the child. You know, you don't catch him. And put him back on that table. He's going to expect you to catch him again. That child's going to sit at the dinner table. and You know what? It's going to be food here. I don't know what it is going to be. But it's going to be food here. And he laid his hands on them. And departed thence. So Jesus departs. Think about what he says, if this was Santa Claus. You bring the kids to Santa Claus, and he takes off, leaving the kids behind. Uh, kids will be upset, screaming. I'm going to have to take their, their medicine and all that. Santa love. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master. Uh, that's a, okay. What good thing shall I do? What good thing? What works shall I do? That I may have eternal life. I want eternal life. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Absolutely not. It's not church age. Watch what he said. And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? And if you ever dealt with a Jehovah Witness, they say, Well, didn't Jesus say I'm not good? Would you? Jesus is in the flesh. He's human and he's God. He's God and he's human. And he's going to the to the cross and what's going to happen with that on that cross he's going to take our sins right God can't have sins but God and he's also saying good master all right if, if you're acknowledging me as God, good and you said good master then you just acknowledge me as God because God is good how's that he's telling this guy listen good the only one that's good is God. So as you're talking to me, you better acknowledge me as good master, that God is good, that I am God, and I'm good master. I am entitled to how you address me as God. Hope I didn't confuse you. But if thou wilt enter into life, you want salvation? You want eternal life? That's what he just asked. Ready? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, be saved. For the heart man believes on the righteousness, with the mouth confession man, absolutely not. Keep the commandments. Now, do you see where people run to Matthew and get into trouble with salvation? Works. I'm not saved by thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. I am saved, behold, the Lamb of God would take away the sin of the world. That's how I'm saved. I'm saved by the blood, not commandments. For by grace are ye saved, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. He says unto him, which? <laughs> he wants an alibi. Which one, Lord? Thou shalt do no murder. Ooh. Look what topped the list of Jesus. 
the commandment. He said, keep the commandments. What did he first say? Thou shalt do no murder. That's going on in America today. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Ooh, Hollywood. Thou shalt not steal. Ooh, banking. Used car salesman. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Lying. Courtroom. Presidential race. Politicians. Honor thy father and thy mother. And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You want to be saved by works? Go ahead, do all those. All the time. Every time. You want to be saved by works. And a young man. I'm just reading my notes here. Said unto him, Jesus, All these have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? Morally, he's right. And before we get to verse 21, as we do to verse 21, Jesus never rebukes him. He says, no, you know what? I said thou shalt not bear false witness. You're a liar. Jesus does not say that. Jesus says, keep the commandments, and he gives us a list of commandments. And this guy says, I've done it. All right, if he's done it and Jesus has not rebuked him, Jesus said unto him, if that will be perfect. Remember what he said about uh, John the Baptist's father and his wife Elizabeth? They were perfect before the Lord. You remember what he said about Job, perfect before the Lord? They can actually do what the Bible says. Go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor. And thou shalt have treasures in heaven and come and follow me. You did all those works, you're not finished with the works. Keep on doing works. How's that for salvation? Jesus never rebuked him for, hey, I've done it. All right, now go sell everything you have. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had yet great possession. Oh, the coveting, number 10. I forget. It says, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife, thy neighbor field. Oh, he couldn't keep all the commandments, could he? Jesus knew that. Jesus purposely, purposely left out that last one. Deal with the Roman Catholic? Purposely leave out commandment number two and mention the others. Then bring up number two. And they'll say, aids to worship. Then you hand me your Bible. Can you find that in the Bible for me, please? Chapter and verse. Then, then said Jesus unto his disciples. The guy's gone. Leaves Jesus and disciples standing there. Brother, I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly, not all, but for most. Remember, more, uh, what is it? Few will enter the straight gate, but many shall go the broad way. He's not saying every rich man. He's saying hardly enter. But most rich men enter in the kingdom of heaven. Wealth can be a hindering for your soul. Your wealth can put your soul in hell. Money has a weird thing about it. It's... And I'm, I'm not going to say anything more. I'd probably sin if I keep going. But money, there's just something weird about money. And a person's attitude. And again I say unto you. It is easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle. Than for a rich man to enter in the kingdom of God. And you know, have you ever heard people. Well that's a gate in Jerusalem. Go read and study the book of Nehemiah. And get yourself a concordance and run the word gate and find me a gate that's called the eye of a needle. You know what Jesus meant when he said that? You take an eye of a needle that you thread a thread with. And it's easier for a camel to go through that needle than for a rich man to go in it. 
Now, see, we can't preach that in our liberal, rich churches because we may lose that $1,000 tithe of Mr. Doctor or Lawyer. We don't want to offend them. But what is the possibility of a camel to go through an eye of a sewing needle? We'll find out in a minute. When his disciples heard, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? They were amazed at the at the marriage. Now their marriage went away, man. Well, who, who, that were salvation, Lord. What, a, we thought everybody could get saved. Except for those, public, those publicans and, and sinners, ew. But Jesus beheld and said unto them, With men this is impossible. That rules out religion. And science. But with God all things are possible. If a rich man will be, be brought to God by the Holy Spirit, bringing his heart to the gospel of Jesus Christ, that camel can go right through the eye of a needle. But if that rich man comes to a man to be saved, you ain't going to get the camel through the needle. Absolutely impossible. With man. That verse right there, you attack with religion. Religion is man-made. Jesus Christ is able to get that camel through the, through the eye of the needle. How's that? J.C. Penney was saved, a saved man. And he gave his employees church time off. He shut his store down so they can go to church. And there's countless stories of men I, I, I can't name who are rich. Today, 2016, there are men that are rich. And in order for them to get saved, God would have to put that camel through the eye of a needle upon Calvary's cross. With the blood atonement, the gospel that Jesus died for our sins according to the scripture. He was buried and arose again the third day. That's how you get a camel through an eye of an evil. Ain't going to do it religion or man. And answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and follow thee. What shall we have therefore? You know, wait a minute. What about, okay, what about us? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, the disciples, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, recreating, making new, the millennium. I lost my place. Where am I reading? Generation. When the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, Jerusalem, he Ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel, excluding Judas. So he's already telling you that there's going to be somebody who's going to replace Judas. Now, you ever hear the you ever hear something called the second coming of Jesus Christ? You ever hear that? You believe that? All right. What about the second coming of Andrew, Peter, James, John, uh, Matthew? <laughs> the second coming of Paul. The second coming of the twelve disciples, the twelve apostles of the land. They're coming back. You know how I know I'm coming back behind Jesus on the horses? Because he said those twelve disciples are coming back and there's going to be thrones. And we're going to have rulership on this earth in the millennium. Well, guess who's going to be over us? The twelve apostles sitting on thrones. Guess who's going to be over them? David the prince. Guess who's going to be over David? Jesus Christ sitting on his throne. So you see there is a government authority in the millennium. You better get used to your government authority now because there's one coming in the millennium. And Christ is going to rule with a rod of iron as king, not president. You do what I say or the people of that land, not Christians, will jump in the lake. So you will see Peter, James, John, Matthew, and the whole list. Except for Judas. So he prophesies 12. One of them is Satan. So that's a prophecy that there's going to be 
and maybe Matthias in Acts 1 or 2, I forget which one, or 3. They chose. I think it's 1. See that prophecy that Jesus has told you? And everyone that has forsaken houses. Did you get that word? Everyone. You know who did that? Abraham. Or brethren. You ever left your house and moved for the Lord? You ever left your brethren for the Lord? Your sister. Sisters. Or father. Or mother. Or wife. Or children. Or lands. For my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. Now we're not going to get thrones like the apostles, but think about the hundredfold you're going to get. How about your, how about your sick and diseased body right now? What would be a hundredfold of that? Absolutely without pain and no sorrow. You ever cry? You ever have tears? What about a body that will never cry again? You ever have a problem? We were talking to my wife and I earlier about a garden. How hard is it? What about a garden would be in the millennium? If you leave things for Jesus Christ, or if people leave you, you will be rewarded. There's a reward. At the judgment seat of Christ. But many that are first shall be last. And the last shall be first. And I don't understand that. The first are the apostles. The disciples of Jesus Christ. The last. Who's that? Whoever the last year of the church age. Or, we're not talking about the church of the Jewish people. But other than verse 30, I can't explain. Serving the Lord has its rewards beyond what you will leave the Lord for. You take ten dollars I'm not saying give God ten he's gonna give you ten thousand but if you give ten dollars to God and instead of going out and buy something stupid that reward that ten dollars would be a hundredfold now, I'm not saying a hundred dollars it may be in glory you get that return but God has a book up there and he's recording deposits he's recording withdrawals he's recording dividends and he's recording interest Put your things in that heavenly bank account. And you wait to see what the God will put the interest in you. And according to this verse that Jesus spoke, you get 100% interest. Try to go find that in a worldly bank. God is so much better.